attentions of the press. Davina Sheffield, pursued across airport tarmacs, had already discovered just how irksome it can be. So had Lady Jane Wellesley, daughter of the Duke of Wellington and a long-time companion of Prince Charles. In an unguarded moment, the Prince had once told a magazine interviewer that 30 was a good age for marriage. As his 30th birthday came and went, the search for a suitable bride hotted up. The papers unveiled a cavalcade of girlfriends. Elizabeth Manners, the Duke of Rutland's niece, Lady Sarah Spencer, Lady Diana's elder sister, and Sabrina Guinness. Then it was the turn of Anna Wallace. Old hopes of a match with a suitable foreign princess like Marie Astrid of Luxembourg were revived. Even Princess Nora of Liechtenstein was considered a candidate. Prince Charles, long used to imaginative matchmaking, whoever he met, took it all in good part. And even joked when asked to present press awards. And I rather feel that uh, being here today is uh, rather like asking a pheasant to award uh, the prizes to the best shot. <laughs> Speaking, <laughs> speaking as a pheasant <laughs> with an H, you have been wonderfully sporting shots. <laughs> because I've only got a few pellets in my backside, and you haven't yet brought me down. The engagement, though, ends not just spectator speculation, but the fast-growing sport of kissing the Prince of Wales. From its beginnings in Australia, it had spread rapidly wherever he went, even to those most publicly chaste of ladies, Indian film stars. But now the kissing will have to stop. The man dubbed the world's most eligible bachelor is no longer available. So to the day in July when the bachelor becomes the bridegroom. The wedding ceremony is expected to be held in Westminster Abbey, although that's not certain. But it will be presided over by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr Robert Runsey. Mike Wooldridge asked him how he viewed the prospect. Well, I'm rather excited uh, about it and uh, thrilled uh, to be invited. Yeah, I imagine that these days you don't actually conduct too many weddings yourself. Well, as an Archbishop, you don't have uh, too many weddings to conduct, and I rather miss that side of a priest ministry. Of course, uh, you not only do formal weddings, but sometimes for personal reasons you take weddings, and uh, I expect that I shall get that sort of mixture. It hasn't been officially announced yet, but would it be right to assume that the wedding will take place in Westminster Abbey? And not necessarily so, but that has been the traditional place for most royal weddings. If it's not there, where else do you think it could be? Well, I suppose it could be in St Paul's. Uh, Westminster Abbey is more traditional. St Paul's can, in fact, in, have more people there. Well, wherever and whenever, it is going to be a grand occasion, the marriage of the heir to the throne. That's inevitable. Protocol and tradition dictate that it should be so. Just as they dictate that along with the informal pictures today in the palace grounds and that delightfully frank and honest interview, there should be the formal pictures for the history books. They were taken by Lord Snowden. They show a young lady as attractive and charming in the photographer's studio as she is in the flesh. A young lady who won the heart of a prince, the teenager who will one day be queen. Now to the rest of the day's news. And we'll begin with the attempted coup in Spain. It ended this morning after nearly 18 hours when the right-wing colonel who'd been leading the rebellion put down his gun and surrendered. His supporters, those who were still with him at the end, surrendered as well, and the 350 MPs who'd been held hostage in the Spanish Parliament were allowed to leave. Our reporter, Christopher Morris, was in the Parliament, the Cortes, when the attempted coup began, and he saw it end. By dawn, it was clear that the rebels' attempted coup was going badly wrong, but inside the Parliament, they still defiantly refused to surrender or to release the hostages. The turning point came when King Juan Carlos broadcast to the nation, and to the Spanish armed forces in particular. He warned the Crown could not tolerate action by anyone against the established order. Military chiefs immediately responded to the King's demands for unity, and at the Cortes, their negotiations with the rebels were reaching the most crucial stage. The breakthrough finally came when a dozen of the rebels decided to give themselves up. And shortly afterwards, the others, realizing the hopelessness of their position, agreed to hand over their weapons and to surrender.
Minutes later, the women hostages suddenly appeared, walking from the parliament building. Some of them were weeping openly, others were white-faced with shock. Nevertheless, they were unharmed and obviously delighted to be free. And at noon, the women were followed by all the Spanish MPs looking none the worse for their night-long ordeal at gunpoint. The swift ending of the siege and the safe release of all the hostages is undoubtedly a major political victory for King Juan Carlos. For 18 hours, Spain's fledgling democracy teetered on the brink of disaster. But that democracy, though shaken, remains mostly intact. And intact, too, in the chamber, we were able at last to retrieve our film of last night's dramatic takeover. This was the moment when the rebels forced their way inside. They were led by Colonel Tejero, who strode menacingly towards the podium, brandishing a pistol. The shocked MPs looked on nervously. Then more civil guards, their guns aimed, crowded into the chamber. The firing started as we dived for cover and the unmanned cameras carried on recording. Clearly, the shooting was designed to frighten, not to kill. Nevertheless, some MPs were slightly hurt by falling masonry as bullets ricocheted from the ceiling. And an ugly scene developed when Senor Gutierrez Mollado, the vice president, was grabbed as he tried to intervene. The former prime minister, Senor Suarez, came to his rescue. Then a strange silence returned to the chamber. But the MP's ordeal was not yet over. The next 18 hours will forever remain the most frightening of their lives, the most critical hours for Spain since the Civil War over 40 years ago. Christopher Morris, BBC, Madrid. And since Tejero's arrest, the authorities in Madrid have detained 18 army officers and taken a top commander in for questioning. Andrew Pike, the British businessman held in jail in Iran, is to be put on trial on charges of espionage and embezzlement. The Iranian prosecutor general said Mr. Pike, arrested last August at Tehran airport, will face an Islamic revolutionary tribunal. The three other detained Britons, missionary Jean Modell and doctors John and Audrey Coleman, are now expected to leave Iran tomorrow morning. According to the official news agency in Tehran, all three will be on the morning flight to Paris. The number of people out of work in the United Kingdom has again risen sharply this month. Now, more than one in ten of the working population are out of a job. The unemployment figures for February now stand at 2,463,294, an increase of nearly 44,000 on January. Our industrial correspondent says that although the increase is lower than in recent months, unemployment is expected to go on rising for some time. The problem of replacing old jobs with new ones is facing many areas, such as Corby in Northamptonshire, already hit by steel closures, as Ian Ross reports. They've started pulling down the steelworks. When British Steel ended iron and steel making at Corby last year, 5,500 were made redundant. Other closures in the town added 1,700, pushing male unemployment to one in four. New jobs don't roll off the assembly line like the plastic bottles made by this half-Dutch, half-Swedish firm. The automated manufacturing process means work for only 30 now, but more later. A Yorkshire company making rubber suspension systems sees its labour force increasing further and faster to between 160 and 200. The construction of a large warehouse and distribution centre for the Oxford University Press is well advanced and will provide work for 180 over a period of time. And with a company making snack foods will come a further 260 jobs. These are just some of Corby's new firms. A dozen advanced factories are ready for occupation and there are takers for all of them. Corby's status as a development area, a steel closure area and an enterprise zone translates into a mix of government grants and incentives which many a new or mobile business must find attractive. So what's the total of promised new jobs so far? 
By the end of 1983, I would say that uh, probably there will be 2,000 more jobs in Corby. Don't you really need to get one big employer? Well, one big employer brings its own problems. We were very pleased, of course, to welcome someone who would employ a substantial number of people into Corby. Uh, the other way, of course, would be to get a, a number of medium-sized employers, perhaps five or six hundred people in each, who would uh, diversify the industrial base in the town. At Corby and other places, British Steel shed 50,000 jobs last year. So the Industry Secretary, Sir Keith Joseph, reminded the House of Commons this afternoon when he gave the government's delayed reply to BSC's corporate plan and cash requirements. Delayed because of the rising clamour among Tory backbenchers about the huge sums going to subsidise the state steel industry and the effect this is having on the unsubsidised private steelmakers. And they are huge sums, as Sir Keith acknowledged, with no guarantee of survival, he pointed out. This Conservative government will have supported BSC to the tune of £1,121 million in the financial year ending next month, and the corporation will get the full £730 million it has asked for for the 12 months from April. More than one and three quarter thousand million pounds of taxpayers' money in two years. Furthermore, BSC's balance sheet will be reconstructed. £3,000 million of capital will be written off and £509 million of debts extinguished. This will be effected in legislation which would also allow for the virtual close down of BSC. Yeah, to see whether it can be made viable, and if it can't be made viable, then by legislation we've introduced today, we shall have power to virtually to close down British Steel. That's not necessarily by closing the whole thing, but by selling, or other dis way disposing, or closing down. And would you go ahead and virtually close it down? It won't be primarily the government that decides. It will be for the board of BSC and Mr. McGregor, the chairman, under the legislation which Labour carried through to nationalise British Steel, the power to close or to dismiss was given entirely to the management. Within six to 12 months, Sir Keith would expect about 15 to 25 percent of BSE's business to be taken out of the public sector through the creation of more private companies joining the overlapping interests of BSC and private steelmakers. And BSC has been told also to compete fairly with the unsubsidized private sector. There is nothing so unfair, says Keith, as a nationalized loss-making business. The executive of the second biggest union in the water industry, the National Union of Public Employees, has told its 10,000 members they can take industrial action if there's no improvement in the employer's 10% pay offer. Tomorrow, leaders of all four unions in the industry will be meeting in London to consider their next step. They're expected to give notice of a national strike if there's no increase in the offer. But some water workers in Lancashire wouldn't wait for the national decision. In Manchester and Rochdale, they've come out unofficially. The Polish Prime Minister, Stanisław Kania, has told the Communist Party Congress in Moscow that his country can solve its own problems. He was apparently asking his allies for more time for Poland to get itself straight. And yesterday's proposal by President Brezhnev for a summit meeting with President Reagan has been welcomed by the White House. The President said he find the idea most interesting, and he'll discuss it with Mrs. Thatcher when she visits Washington later this week. Pope John Paul has made another appeal for peace in Japan, referred to by the Pope as a land still left with the scars of atomic bomb attacks. Earlier in the day, Pope John Paul had a historic meeting with Emperor Hirohito at the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. He was greeted at the entrance personally by the emperor, who told him, you are welcome, although I know you must be tired. The two men shook hands and then went inside for a 45-minute meeting, 15 minutes longer than had been arranged. The Pope has called on Japan to share its wealth with the poorer nations of Asia, and he appealed to Christians and non-Christians alike in the country to protect human rights. Uh, football and Leicester City, third from the bottom of the first division, say the former Dutch World Cup player Johan Cruyff could soon be joining them. It's hoped the deal will be completed in time for him to play in Saturday's home match against Nottingham Forest. Cruyff, who's 33, will receive around £5,000 a game. And now tonight's results in Division 1 Arsenal 2, Manchester City 0, Brighton 2, Southampton 0, in Division 2 Bolton 2, Oldham 0. 
Division 4, Scunthorpe 1, Port Vale 1. And in the Scottish League Division 1, the Falkirk and Motherwell game was postponed. In the Scottish League Division 2, the Stenhouse Muir 0, Albion 3. And finally, tonight's international, Republic of Ireland 1, Wales 2. That's the latest score. And so once more to the main story of the day at home, the engagement of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer. They'll marry in late July, but exactly when and where is still to be decided. From today, Lady Diana lives under royal protection, and until the wedding, at Clarence House. And at Buckingham Palace this afternoon, the couple revealed that they'd kept their secret for several weeks. <laughs> Prince Charles had proposed in early February, and Lady Diana accepted immediately. The heir to the throne says he's positively delighted about their forthcoming wedding, and his future queen says she is blissfully happy. And we add our congratulations to the many thousands that have been pouring in all day. Good night. Good evening. Well, this ridge of high pressure will still be bringing fairly dry weather for much of England and Wales tomorrow, but these fronts and the strengthening winds will bring some rain and snow across Scotland and Northern Ireland. The satellite picture this evening shows those fronts out to the west as a broad band of cloud, and you can see it there to the left of your picture. The cloud for most of England, though, is beginning to break up, and that's going to lead to a widespread frost. You can see those showers coming up towards the southeastern corner of the country as well. So on tonight's chart, two things, really. Firstly, a widespread frost, quite a sharp frost indeed for the more central parts, particularly in the Midlands, and still some snow showers coming along near the southeastern coasts from time to time. Up in the north, it's going to become cloudier and quite windy from the west, with some snow reaching Northern Ireland and Western Scotland later this evening, and moving to some central areas, perhaps with some drifting later on as well. And for tomorrow, well, England and Wales, I think generally a dry, bright day. There'll be some sunshine, perhaps some freezing fog patches around to begin with, but they should clear by around the middle of the day. Still some snow showers near the southeastern coast, so it's going to feel quite cold there again with a northeasterly wind, perhaps rather cloudy at times as well. Well, up in the north, starting off with some snow around, but that's going to turn to rain from the west during the day. And I think perhaps in Northern Ireland you may find the rain easing up altogether later on in the afternoon, but staying unsettled in the west and cold in the east. And that's it. Programmes for Wednesday night on BBC One. At 7.30, Doctor in the House, starring Dirk Bogard and James Robertson Justice. Hang on to your swabs, gentlemen. This is terribly important. You can cut the patient's throat while he's under an anaesthetic and nobody will mind, but if you leave anything inside, you'll be in the Sunday papers in no time. Catch him somewhere. After the news, Sports Night at 9.25 features highlights of Charlie Magri's defence of his European flyweight title and from Stonely, a unique relay competition. Lionel and Pam Dunning are just one of the husband and wife teams competing for the Lancome Trophy. At 10.15, Open Secret looks at a question of control. In the cockpits of the world's airlines, the use of computers is increasing. Peter Williams investigates the delicate balance between man and machine. And finally, at 10.45, Michael Parkinson's guests are Julian Pettifer, AJP Taylor, Rose Murphy and Kim Novak. Programmes tomorrow night on BBC One. Because of the extended edition of the news, the rest of tonight's programmes are now later than published, with Omnibus in Dallas starting at 5 to 11. Now on BBC One, The Union by Tony Perrin, a dramatised impression of the events surrounding an infamous ballot rigging case which went to the High Court 20 years ago. It's the play for today.